Hopefully I convinced you, hopefully I convinced you uh, rectangles and areas of polar rectangles are tricky. So we're going to go a little bit further into getting these areas. So we saw there was an area of a full circle, but then you have to multiply by the percentage of a full circle angle. So that's how we got this area right here. Now things are going to get a little bit more tricky. No, they won't get any more tricky, actually. We'll just write down the area of a circle, uh, which is 2 pi r h. No, just 2 pi r. No, that's not the area. What's wrong with this? Pi r squared? Does that look right? OK. What is I using? I was using f of theta. So you can use r or f of theta, however you want to write it. So pi's are going to cancel. We have 1 half r squared delta theta. And we can write this as 1 half f of theta delta theta. When this goes into an integral, this delta theta part turns into d theta. So our delta theta turns into d, d theta. Why did uh, r squared into f of Because uh, r is f of theta. So I just replace. So it would be f squared theta. Oh, absolutely. Yes. So the area is just basically the integral of this expression right here. So area is the sum of all these. We call them AKs. Yep. Well, you take a limit of the sum, or else it's just an approximation. Lim n approaches infinity. Summation AK equals 0 to n. So sum up all the small areas and then take that limit. And of course, we write the limit as an integral from little a to b. Oh, alpha to beta is how I wrote it before. Alpha to beta. So that's the area formula you need. And we just saw where it came from. Cardioid? Heart, yeah. heart shaped thingy. A what? A heart shaped thingy. Okay. Graph. That was on the quiz last Friday, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, but it was written in parametrics, so it was not it was not a polar question. So your quiz sort of looked like this, but it was very different because it was written in a parametric form. Okay. And the way you compute area is very different. All right, region enclosed by. So what I did not give you is the bounds. So I didn't give you the small uh, alpha and the big beta. So we could use graphing program to graph this out. Is there a theta value that gives me r equals 0? There is. Pi, or any, let's see, odd multiple of pi would work. So 1 pi, 3 pi, or negative 1 pi, negative 3 pi. So we can choose where we want to start it. 
So let's begin at the origin. Now origin in xy coordinates is 0, 0. We have to be a little bit careful. So this is rectangular. Let's write down the polar coordinates of the origin, or polar point on the origin. So it's going to have radius. It's going to be an r theta. Now you have to be careful. Radius will be 0, and you just told me the theta that corresponds to 0 is pi. So it's a little strange. This is at the origin. Is this point even on the graph? Zero, zero in polars. So we want to be careful. When r is when theta is zero, what do we get for r? So we got one plus cos zero, which is two times one plus one, which is four. So you want to be careful. So is this point on the graph? The answer is no, absolutely not. So you want to be very careful. Polar points are tricky, especially at the origin. So how do you, why did you say no? So like it ends up being 4. But so the point zero, 04 is on the graph. Oh, but not 0, 0. But not zero, zero. Be, because I'm in polar coordinates, it's really important that you pay attention to what system you're in. So the 0, 0 and rectangular would be on the graph. but in polar coordinates, that would correspond to 0 pi. So that's tricky because your angle at the origin could be anything. In this example, the angle at the origin we said was odd multiples of pi. All right, so let's ignore all this right here. It's important to pay attention to. All right, so we're going to go from the origin back to the origin. So you can choose which way we go. We can either go positive or negative. Let's go positive. So, so initial angle alpha equals pi. We got that right above. So our final angle at the origin is 3 pi. So we'll come back to the origin at 3 pi. Now it's tricky without a graph to know if we're going clockwise or counterclockwise around. If we're going one direction, remember the area will be positive. If we go the other direction, the area will be negative. So depending on the way this is oriented, we might get a negative area. If I took the time to graph it and saw what my region looked like, I think cardioids vaguely look kind of like that, depending on how they're oriented. but. There'll be some orientation on it, and however that orientation is, if it goes counterclockwise, we'll have a positive area, and if it goes counter uh, clockwise, we'll have a negative area. So without a graph, it's a little tricky to tell which way we're going to rotate. However, we can still find the area. So the area formula we just wrote down, alpha, beta, 1 half, f theta squared, d theta. So we got alpha and beta, pi to 3 pi. You can use symmetry, but again, you have to know what the symmetry is on the graph. So this is an easy integral to finish. The first two are very easy antiderivatives. Antiderivative of 1 is theta. Antiderivative of 2 cos theta. 
is 2 sine theta. What about the last term? How do you integrate cos squared? Could it be 2 um, cos cubed and factor it out? Wait, yeah, no. quick question. Yeah. Wouldn't the, the 2 be squared? So it wouldn't yeah. cancel out with the half, and it would just become like. Two. Ooh. So, so there should be extra 2 in the front? Yeah. Absolutely. All right, how do we integrate cos squared? Power reduction formula, pre-calculus. So that's how you integrate cosine squared. You don't, you change it around. So you use this power reduction identity. That's the same thing as the uh, thing above? Yes. That's a good question if you should have all the trig identities you need for integration. Most, so if I ask you to integrate, it's usually worth one or two points out of 10 or something like that. It's a small portion. So if you don't have it written down, it's not going to be that big of a penalty. So I would say don't, don't worry too much about those. You should know they exist. Yeah. <laughs> Given 10 minutes, you should be able to integrate that, what I have written on the board. Well, really given five or so, or at least know where to look. So now we're going to look at area of a region between two polar curves. So look at area between a function of theta and another function of theta. Now you have to know which is the big function and which is the small function. So one of the two functions is bigger than the other one uh, for some interval. So you need to figure out which one is bigger and which one is smaller. So we're going to suppose, suppose, suppose a better word than assume. So we're going to suppose is that R? I don't know. Okay, I just figured it out. R one of theta. What if you get that wrong? So <coughs> we're going to suppose the one function R one is bigger than R two. If it's the other way around, just switch the names of the functions. <laughs> so this is what they say: without loss of generality, we'll suppose one's bigger than the other. Yeah, is that greater than or equal? Yeah, greater than or equal to. For theta between alpha and beta. So you have to find uh, alpha and beta. Usually you intersect the curves. Beta. No, not not the one that you just throw the one in in the brackets. It's what a. Uh, it's a beta. <laughs> okay. There's no there's no b variables here. Okay. All right. So what's the area look like? You're basically going to be subtracting the two. Uh, we have to do it carefully. So you remember you take the big area minus the small area. So that's how we dealt with uh, hollow shapes or anytime we want a big one, uh, a big function and a small function, we want some area in between. Uh, we write
write that out. Integral one half, we said the big one was R1. So it'll be R1 of theta squared d theta minus one half R2 of theta squared d theta. There's not so much you can do. So you can bring out the one half. And if you really want to, you can write it as uh, big R, big R squared minus little r squared. So it looks more like the formula you were used to. So you got big R and little r like that. So whichever of these forms work better for you, I'm going to let you decide which one to use on your formula page. So you only need one of these versions. Well, the top one's not really too helpful, but you need one of these versions. So let's go ahead and start this with a graph. And then we will figure out where do these intersect and then which is on the inside and outside. And then what we're going to do is ignore the graph and try to answer that, try to come up with the same uh, interval without knowing what the graph looks like. So you can graph the unit circle. That's super easy. It's a little bit less easy to graph this. I think it's a cardioid. I'm going to do a really rough sketch of it and just go 0 to 2 pi. I'm just going to go with the multiples of pi over 2. So I used a very few number of points because I had a pretty good idea of what the cardioid would look like. So this is kind of a hybrid, partially clueless, but I was not totally clueless. So I didn't need a huge number of points to graph this out. It's like if you have a, a parabola and you know the vertex and one other point, you can graph it out pretty quickly, just knowing a parabola and two points on it. All right, let's draw the circle. So a circle has radius 1. So there's the circle. And I said inside circle, outside cardioid. So inside the circle, outside the cardioid. Uh-oh. Yeah, there are two places that's happening. Well, really one place. So we want this funky. Oh, it's Batman's boomerang. Right? Yeah. yeah, there we go. Very applicable. Also looks like a parachute sideways. Or a parachute. Alright, so I want that area. So what do I need first? Well, I'll need that eventually. So I need an interval. So find alpha and beta. 
So we need to intersect these curves. So that's what we're going to do right now, intersect the curves. I can highlight the points in blue on the graph where they intersect. Good news is there's not that many points of intersection, really just two. The origin is not an intersection point. Why is the origin not an intersection? Circle doesn't cut through the origin. The other, uh, the funky cardioid definitely goes through, but the circle doesn't go through. All right, so let's get the curves, interset the curves. So you intersect by substituting one uh, variable and one into the other, so r equals one. So we'll take the one and plug it in for that r value. All right, figure out what theta values we have when they intersect. Yes, technically, but that also means cos theta equals zero, either way. All right, so theta is pi over two or negative pi over two or three pi over two, et cetera, et cetera. So that should correspond to our graph. If you loop around the circle, you have intersections at the top and bottom. We just have to choose two consecutive values. Let's go negative pi over two to positive pi over two. All right, I want to warn you, there's a danger. How do I know that I took the values in the shaded area, meaning the right half and not the left half? If you have a graph, it's pretty clear. That I chose the right ones, as opposed to pi over two to three pi over two. If I did pi over two to three pi over two, I'd be on the other part of the graph. So let's say you don't know what your graph looks like. All the algebra we did right here, you didn't need the graph for that. And I'm going to choose two consecutive values. How do I know that the circle, let's see, we're going back to the original. How do I know I'm inside the circle and outside the cardioid? So for data in this interval, Is this? Are we inside the circle and outside the cardioid? So our first function, I'm going to call it R1 of so we're supposed to be inside the circle. So that's the that's the big function, and the small function was one minus cos theta.
So the question is, is R1 actually bigger than R2 on this interval? So the reason I called the circle big, because we're supposed to be inside the circle, so it's the outer bound. So big is the outer bound. And we're supposed to be outside the cardioid, so this is the inner bound. So any questions about that idea of why the outer bound's the big one, the inner bound is the small one? Now the question is, on the interval we're considering, is it true that the R1 function is bigger? So here's how you check it without a graph. You can pick any point in between, or any value in between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, and then decide which way does the inequality go. So what's the easiest point we can test? Zero. Zero. Pi over 6 would have been just fine too. But let's Easiest one will go with zero. So check by plugging in uh, theta in the interior of the interval. What would I get if I plugged in theta at the boundary, either pi over 2 or negative pi over 2? you would get the same value on both sides. So they're equal. They better be equal. That's where we got those numbers from. That was when the two functions intersected. So if you plug in the endpoints, you'll get the same number on both functions. So that won't be very helpful. So we need to pick a number that's not at the end to figure out which one is above or below. How do I know that there won't be a number in between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 that uh, both of these would be equal for? because we just wrote down every number they're equal for. And none of those numbers are between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. The next time they'll be equal is 3 pi over 2 or 5 pi over 2. So those are outside the interval. So we're basically making a sine graph, deciding if it's positive or negative. It's basically what we're doing. All right, so let's figure out what is r1 of 0 and r2 of 0. r1 of 0 is what? One, that was easy. What's R2 of zero? zero. So it's one minus cos zero, one minus zero, which is zero. So yes, the R1 function is bigger at zero than R2. There's a smiley face. Well, that's not true. That's what I, yeah. Wait, that's, that wasn't the mistake. The mistake was that should be a one. Oh, yeah. The problem was I was talking and listening <laughs> and writing at the same time. And you better not get equality. You better get a strict inequality. If you got equality, it means you missed an intersection point above. All right, so I want you to see what happens if you pick an interval that the big and the small are switched. So we're going to try theta between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. And I want you to repeat the exact same process. And you may want to block this off because this is not going to be the interval we use, but I want you to see what it's like to pick a bad interval and how you can detect it after you picked it. So do the same process. Pick the easy, what's the easiest value in this interval? So we'll go with pi. Why is pi the easiest interval? Uh, I just think it's... I'm, I'm, I'm just, just pick, any, pick any theta value you want in between those two numbers. You can choose 5 pi over 6, no problem. Okay. 7 pi over 6. So we're just, uh, yeah, if you take this back to the unit circle, we're on the left half, basically. You can pick any angle that's not the top or the bottom. 
So I just say grab that one, it's the easiest. But they do have to be in the inside that that bird. Oh, that's that's super important. Yeah. <coughs> so now we discovered our little function is not little anymore. So I was pretty clear if you have the graph. If you don't have the graph, it is not clear at all. So I don't want you to spend a long time trying to do the clueless method of plotting things out very carefully. I'd rather you find intersection points and then pick two consecutive ones and decide is that the interval I want or should I shift over and get two other consecutive points. Is our two always going to be one minus two whatever you choose? I, well, so these functions were given to me at the beginning of the problem. They were, oh, I, see it. I chose that to be R1 and this one is R2. I just gave them names. Oh. And big and small was determined by the wording of the problem. Inside the circle, this is the ba big bound. And outside means that's the outer one. Oh no. We want to be outside. This is worded in a confusing way. So just like before, big function and small function trade places. And you have to pick the interval where the big is the big and the small is the small. They're two different uh, curves. So I, I just gave them names, R1 and R2, so we could tell them apart later. All right, we haven't done any calculus yet. All we do is figure out endpoints. So let's go ahead and set up the area. All the hard work is done. You just need the formula and set it up. So the good news is if you switch at this point, if you made a mistake and put the wrong uh, curve in the wrong spot, what would you get? Negative. So if you at this point, if you accidentally swapped R1 and R2, you get negative. All right, so you can integrate this same double, uh, not double, power reduction formula on cosine after you square it. So it's a very similar integral to the one we just looked at. So what can we do with the integral aside from finding area? So we're going to do arc length next. So just like with arc length before, the arc length is easier in one sense because you pretty much know your beginning and ending, in this case, data values. 
So the tricky part is that actually setting up the integral is not easy because you have to put two derivatives squared in there, basically. So length of will give the curve r will just be f of theta, and we need theta to be in some interval. We'll just use alpha and beta. Keep it easy. Use the same letters. So x is r cos theta, y is r sine theta, which is f theta sine theta, and x is f theta cos theta. So length in rectangular. In the good old days, we had, what was one version? I think we had dx squared plus dy squared. That'd be one version for arc length. So what we're going to do now is, so that was from back in the day. <laughs> well, we used it last week when we did parametric. But it was from calculus two is where we first saw arc length show up. With the square root of the derivative squared added together. It was certainly used in, in the parameterized arc lengths. So our dx, what we're going to do is write dx. Uh, we're going to multiply by d theta over d theta now. That's dx, so dx squared. All right, so that's dx squared. We'll do the same thing. dy is going to act exactly the same. So I'm not going to repeat all the exact same steps. And now we're going to log all those into our, we're going to rewrite our length computation. Okay, so this looks really ugly. What can I factor out? D theta. D theta. D theta. Now, when you bring, you factor out d theta squared, it goes out of the square root as just d theta because it was squared inside the square root, and so it goes out of the square root as just d theta. And that's arc length right there. The only difference is I'll put alpha and beta in instead. Now, unfortunately, so this looks really nice. Unfortunately, dx d theta is not that nice. So let's look back really quickly at dx d theta. 
So somewhere up here, x is r cos theta, or f theta cos theta. Now we're going to apply dd theta to this equation. What rule do you have to use here? Left side super easy. I'll do that. What rule do I need on the right side? I don't want to need chain rule. Product rule. Product rule. So go ahead and use a product rule here. I think we did this derivative a few days ago. Should be pretty easy. So that's dx d theta. It's pretty ugly. You're going to then square this thing and put it into the integral. Square the whole thing? Yep. So that is the first piece. You have to square it in the integral. All right, second piece, start with y, which is f theta sine theta. And find dy d theta. So same exact thing, just slightly different product rule. That's what it says right there. Take the theta derivative of the y. <coughs> so you should be able to tell it's going to be ugly when we plug all these in and square them out. But we should get some cancellation. So let's see if we can simplify, how much we can simplify in the last two minutes of class. So some serious trig foiling and then using some identities with sines and cosines. Mainly sine squared plus cos squared equals one. So that's gonna be the main identity you're gonna use here. So carefully plug these in. You can just write f prime and cosine. You don't have to write of theta because we've been doing this for long enough. We know these are functions of theta. I would not let my calculus one class do this, but you're in calculus three or something like that. So the reason I didn't have to write of x of x of x is because I know everything in here is a product, not function composition. So the danger comes into play if you had see sine cosine like this. If you just see sine cosine, do I mean, no, do I mean sine of cosine of x or do I mean sine x 
cos x. So that's why you can't just write like this. It's not clear which of those two I'm referring to. Do I mean function composition or products? However, I know everything in, in here I wrote down is a product, so I'm not concerned in this problem. But that's why you don't want to do this in general, because you get ambiguity. So I guess we'll have some fun cancellation when we come back.